Okay, so we'll be looking at Jeremiah. Uh, just to kind of recap, we looked at Jeremiah chapter 1. So Jeremiah was called by God. God gave a promise to fulfill what he called Jeremiah to do. So he wasn't just telling Jeremiah to talk. He was also saying, hey, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to fulfill what I'm, what I'm having you say. And then the warning of coming judgment, which was the Babylonian Empire. So um, if you want to know what's going on, you might want to think about... Um, Reading Jeremiah uh, 2 through 3. Uh, in a relationship, what would be the thing that would make you break up? You're dating your dream girl. Everything's great. What would be the thing that makes you break up? Or your dream guy. Whatever. There's a lot. Like if... if you could say the biggest thing, then. Did you have a biggest thing? Uh, there's, not, like, there's a lot of big things, but like... like yeah, cheating or something like that. Or, like, she was like... Uh, was that the first thing that entered your brain? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, would be maybe one other thing to you. Um. Let's see. I I I don't know, just like that, just like cheating all the stuff, and like, or whenever they're they're not putting, like they're not like showing you like respect, or like you're not putting their time in to actually like do anything or put effort into it mm -hmm. or put yeah put effort into their relationship and actually be a couple like a, a couple and all stuff and you yeah okay all right here she well my first initial thought was um i probably wouldn't break it off i'd probably wait for them to break it off <laughs> just because i feel like when i was when i was a teen or a young adult or whatever I um, I didn't feel like anybody would like me because all my crushes didn't like me back. And so I feel like the first person that would like me, I, I wouldn't break it off because I would think that they're the only person I would be able to be with. Hmm. Huh. Well, that is a very woman answer to say, to have. I mean, that's kind of not something that you would be alone on. There are a lot of women who would have very similar... Actually, some guys I know have similar feelings to you. But use your imagination. And if, 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 if I thought about the question more reasonably without being in a relationship that I want to end, I would say um, if I found out they were cheating on me, I'd probably want to end a, a relationship like dating or whatever. Um, if I found out um, that their beliefs and the um, the religious beliefs differ way off of what mine were, um, if I found out they did like drugs or or heavy drinking, I'd probably uh, break it off for that too because I know different things. If you get married, it just it would be very bad, <laughs> you know. But. I say that without being in a relationship, being in a dating relationship. If I was dating a relationship, I feel like I, I would be blinded. Well, so let's expand it then. Pretend like I didn't say dating because that question actually wasn't dating as relationship. So in the context of marriage too, what would cause you to get a um, divorce? If if he turned really like all of a sudden turned really violent, okay. But even at that, I don't think I would divorce. I think I would just separate from until until he got his life back how he was before, where he wasn't real violent anymore. Oh, okay. Um, I feel like even if if you had a cheating spouse, you can still work through it. It's not like a dead end. It's not a Okay, let's go to divorce now because you cheated on me type thing. Um, I feel like the only thing that would make me step away from the relationship is is real violent because then it's putting you at risk and your kids at risk. Hmm. Okay, so Israel had constantly. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Israel had constantly cheated on God by worshiping other gods and not doing what was right, which is sin. Um, so in the same way that a father disciplines his children, punishment was coming on them. That's that's kind of the idea that's coming on here. Um, he's going to use a lot of different Im imagery, um, metaphors, whatever you want to say, 
uh, during chapter two. And we're not going to get through all of chapter two. I, I wanted to get through chapter two and three, but it just it didn't work out. Um, yeah, that's that's one of the big things going on here is is uh, Israel is like the cheating spouse and the you know going after lovers. Um, so uh, Jeremiah two one through three says this: The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. So there's a lot of things here going on that might not be as easy for us to understand nowadays, so I'll try to break things down. But first, let's kind of set up this prophecy. This prophecy consists of all of chapter 2 and a half of chapter 3. The main theme of it was that Israel abandoned God. And it was given, what date that it was given was around 625. So if Jeremiah was called in 627, 625, you know, you, you have right around that saint. This is one of his very early prophecies. Um, we don't know exactly the date, but we do know that King Josiah was the king. So remember that Josiah was the one that was doing all kinds of spiritual reforms. If you've read St. Chronicles and St. Kings, the parts I told you guys to, you're aware of what's going on. Um, so uh, he's doing all these spiritual reforms. They're they're rebuilding the temple. They've discovered they've rediscovered Deuteronomy. They're, you know, there's doing they're doing all these big things, reinstituting um, uh, different festivals and whatnot. And by and large, though, the people of Judah were not really genuinely seeking God. Though um, they were just kind of making a show of it, kind of going along with it. Josiah was seems like he was um, well well intentioned, like he wasn't he was being sincere about it. But the people, by and large, weren't necessarily. Uh, really totally on board with it. It was like, yeah, okay, we'll do whatever. And uh, Jeremiah, it seems like, um, got a little bit personally frustrated with the situation because it seemed like a time of, ah, things are going to turn around, people are going to get, you know, changed, and, and, and you know, the nation's going to turn around, and then it didn't. So he kind of that has a little bit of disappointment. Uh, I might be reading too much into that. Who knows? Uh, but due to Jeremiah's length, the book of Jeremiah's length, we won't be able to go like super into this like verse by verse. So I'm going to have to break it down more into sections. So the first thing to point out with this is um, here it says, this is what the Lord says, I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness. And the question becomes, when did this happen? I mean, if you read, for instance, Exodus or, or, or Numbers, you see Israel constantly doing these things. And, you know, in, in the law, there, there's, it's full of times of their disobedience, I mean, of, 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 their, of, their, um, of their just messing up. Not just disobedience, but rebellion and grumbling and complaining and doubting and all kinds of bad things are happening. So the question is, what does he mean, I remember the devotion of your youth? When did that even happen? And uh, there's, there's a few things I want to point out. First, th I'm, I'm, we're going to look at three views and then we're going to look at my view. Okay, so... Hold on to your butts here, guys. First off, it's important to notice that God wasn't expecting perfection from Israel. In Jeremiah, he's not saying, I'm bringing you punishment because you guys weren't perfect. Like He, he doesn't say that. He never says that. He's that's not even his point. Um, the beginning of Jeremiah is filled with a lot of judgment, but that's because after generation of generation of generation of them disobeying him, you know that, and not really turning things around, being insincere in their worship and everything. That he, you know, it was time for some strong words. It's like when your kid does something for the fifteenth time, you're like, okay, all right, now let's let's talk about this. You're not gonna do that again, you little turd. <laughs> but uh, and uh, so things were getting more serious, and so God's giving more severe warnings because the punishment is about to come. So. Uh, let's look at those three views. The first view is that God's love, it's talking about God's love, not theirs. In which case, you would read more like this. I remember the devote, I remember um, in your youth, how as a bride, um, I loved you. Uh, I would re read more like that. And, uh, and, and you followed me through the wilderness. Um, I find that view a little bit unconvincing um, <coughs> because the emphasis seems to be on Israel. You know, I remember the. You know, all these. The, you, you were following me. Israel was holy to the Lord. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense if he's if he's saying, you know, how I was treating it. I don't, I don't know. I could be wrong, but it doesn't really fit. The second view is that as a whole, Israel was faithful, and it was just the select few that were being just uh, uh, unfaithful or, or living in sin or whatnot. I'm, I don't think that that view really fits either because if you're reading the law, once again, you see him kind of talking to the whole nation about, you know, hey, this is the punishment that's going to come and, you know, all this all this stuff. And he's talking to all of them. I mean, take, for instance, when, when they sacrificed the golden calves and, like, there's this whole big thing and, like, you know, everybody is, is, is like, oh, we done messed up. 
you know, and, and, and it doesn't really seem like there's any ones that are, like, God's not overly mad at. He's kind of mad at all of them. So it kind of, it, it doesn't really, I'm not sure if that one really fits. And then the third view that people have on this is that their attitude overall was one of seeking him at that time, even though they were messing up a lot. Um, I find that a little bit, um, a little bit kind of like it doesn't really get the big picture and the problem. So I'm going to tell you my view. My view is that he's talking about at different times of Israel's history. So I remember the devotion of your youth. That would be during the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when Abraham left his homeland to go to go travel through this through this barren place that he he wasn't, um, you know, uh, you know. Uh, uh, situated in and then you know his son and everything and there's all these hostile nations around him that, that seems a little bit more to fit and then how as a bride you loved me would be um, different times in their history so like for instance when they committed themselves to God at Mount Sinai that would be one of the times now yes it was preceded by the golden calf incident and it was you know the afterwards there was the whole complaining and all that stuff but there were times in there where they were genuinely seeking God whereas now in the time of Jeremiah they're all disobeying God all at the same time continuously. Um, so that's my opinion. That he's talking about different times. Um, and then obviously uh, how you followed me through through the wilderness, that would be, you know, the time after they were not allowed in the promised land when they followed him around for 40 years before they went back in. So um, uh, that, that's my view. I, I could be totally wrong, but it just really seems to fit. Um so God is probably remembering different times of the past. So that takes us to the, the the second thing I want to mention about this passage. It mentions here that Israel is holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. This is one of those concepts we don't get nowadays because we don't really do the whole first fruits thing. So they would they would grow crops and, and different things and fruit and whatnot. And as the harvest came in, this they would on some crops they had two crops per year. Um, so as the crops came in, they would give the first of those uh, to uh, to the temple. They would give it to, to, to the priest. They would give it to God. Um, so Israel's Israelites were expected to give those first fruits of their harvest to God. It, it was holy to the Lord, it was dedicated to Him, and so that kind of brings up a, a thing: those who ate of that of those first fruits it was it, it was they, they were they were punished by god they, this was something that was dedicated solely to him so in the same way israel was holy to the lord they were his first fruits of his harvest they were holy to him dedicated to him and uh, those who, who who abused her um were were held to task so jeremiah 2 4 through 8 hear the word of the lord you descendants of jacob all you clans of israel this is what the lord says what fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me obviously this is a rhetorical question he hasn't done anything wrong. They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one traveled and no one lives. I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The, the leaders rebelled against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal following worthless idols. So before I, there's three things I want to point out about this passage. But before I get to those three things, I want to just clarify some things. It says here, descendants of Jacob. Jacob is oftentimes used in the prophet to be an inclusive all, all term for like Israel. So Israel and Jacob are used synonymously. So if you see Jacob, he's not talking about a person or a specific tribe. He's, well, sometimes he's talking about a specific tribe. But, um. It's more of an inclusive term, meaning Israel. Um, and here it says, uh, all you clans of Israel, the clans are the same thing as the tribes. So there's 12 tribes, 12 clans, however you want to say it. Um, now, uh, to be more specific, though, the, 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 um, the tribes of Israel had different family groups in those tribes, and those subgroups could also be called clans. So, like, for instance, when they were numbering in the books of, like, obviously numbers, <laughs> and I think it's actually some in uh, Leviticus, um, they are going through, and it says to break them down according to their tribes and according to their clans. What that means is the subgroups and the main groups. So, uh, And then it mentions here the prophets prophesied by Baal, who was Baal. Baal was a god that was worshipped in, in the area, in the Canaan area. So uh, the the uh, 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 Tyre and Sidon, they were Phoenicians. The Phoenicians uh, worshipped Baal, or, and there was different kinds of Bell, like they, and he had different like appendages to his name, so Bell this, Bell that, um, but it's basically one one god. Uh, he was a storm god, fertility god, that kind of stuff. So, okay, 
Um, let's look at three different things. The first thing I want to emphasize is, is he says there, what fault did your ancestors find? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. So though God did nothing wrong and showed mercy to the entire nation, like splitting the water when they were when they were leaving Egypt or providing manna for them in the desert, they worshipped idols which could do nothing. And it's kind of this sense of being overly dramatic, um, emphatic. That's the way, it's, the way of God is being emphatic. He could say like, um, maybe I could say it like this. Surely I have done something wrong that you would do this to me. You know what I mean? Like like you, uh, your spouse cheats on you and you walk in, you see them cheating. Surely I have done something when they are the one who did something wrong. Um <clears throat> And then it says here, they followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. What does it mean that they became worthless themselves? Well, there's two kind of aspects to this. The first thing I want to mention is God gave them their identity. They, they were known as God's people, Yahweh's people, the, 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 the children of God. And um, their, uh, God gave them their blessings that they had, the guidance that they had, and, and, and you know, and his leading. He gave them their protection that they had from, from, other, from other peoples and whatnot. But they exchanged all of that in order to worship idols. And thereby, they, be, they took on the identity of the idols rather than taking on the identity of, the, of, of Yahweh. So, excuse me, the one, that they, the one that they worshiped is the one that they align themselves with and get the, the name for that. So like they had the idea of, 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 of households, right? Like, so you, you, would do, you would get glory for the name of your household. So like for the, for the house of Bor, for the house of Randy, see what I mean? Um, and uh, so there's this kind of idea that um, they, they changed that, what God gave them, their identity that God, Yahweh, gave them, and they instead worshipped these idols. And so they lost that sense, sense of identity. And so rather than being holy, they became worthless because that's who they aligned themselves with. It was worthless. Um, and uh, then another aspect that, that's worth mentioning about this is that what you do changes who you are. The choices that you make in life, they, 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 they start changing who you are and how you react to things. Does that kind of make sense? And so as, as the more that they stopped worshiping Yahweh and started worshiping Baal, for instance, the more it had an impact on them, their, their de development. They did not ask, where is the Lord? So I just want to mention uh, a few things here. Um, first off, it says here, but you came and defiled my land there towards the end. Israel forgot God for the good he had done. And this is something that, that remember, he's not talking to the to nations. He's not talking, he's talking about to his people, his church. Um, we wouldn't call it a church today, but um, they would call it, the, you know, his, his nation. But we the church is his nation, so you kind of have to... Um, this is something that, that we all do today is we, um, can I get you something? Okay. Uh, we all do today is we, we forget the good that God has done and we just kind of focus on all, on all the bad. And, um, you know, so, th so th this is something that they're actively doing. And it says here that they defiled my land. Th there's a few things that, that this brings up. First off, that um, sin brings curses and what we do really does matter. That's the first thing that it brings up. And the second thing was that God was the owner. Um, this wasn't something that, um, you know, oh, well, I, it's my stuff. I can do whatever I want. He makes it absolutely clear you defiled my land, my inheritance. Um, so he mentions three three groups of people. And the priests, the leaders, and the prophets. And this is basically the leadership of the land. And he says that the priests did not ask, where is the Lord? And obviously these this passage here is, is just really, I guess you could see, seething, overflowing, whatever, with irony. The priests are the ones that are basically like the pastors of the ancient, of the Old Testament. Okay, so the pastors they didn't even know God. How could they possibly pastor God's people? If they didn't even know God. And then it says the leaders, or it also calls them those who deal with the law. The same idea. We're talking about political leaders here. Um, they they neither followed God's law. It says here those who deal with the law did not know me. So they so they they didn't even follow God's law, nor uh, nor did they. Uh, nor did they follow um, follow the very one who appointed them. So, so even though God had appointed them to the task, they weren't even um, you know on familiar terms with Him. Uh, the leaders rebelled against me. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the prophets prophesied by Bill. Uh, obviously, prophets were God's mouthpieces to the people, and so here we have another irony that instead of speaking what God said, God's word, they're speaking according to Bill. 
and uh, so I think that we can see something that that is is very concerning to people. They, people say very often, "Oh, well, why is God letting so and so happen or so and so happen?" Here's the thing: corruption is obviously just as bothersome to God as it is to us. Just because He lets people have choices doesn't mean that He is not bothered by the choices that they make. And so Israel had this kind of idea: what did we do wrong? Like. I, I don't get this. What do we do? And if you look at the picture here, this is uh, this is an artifact that was found that has a depiction of Yahweh. And if you'll remember, Yahweh is not supposed to be depicted by any idols or drawings or anything. He's not supposed to be drawn. Um, but here, obviously, they have broken that rule. So that shows you right there they're not really following the law. And they have drawn next to him. It's really hard to see because it's such an old artifact. It dates to, I believe, the 700s to 800s BC, somewhere in there. Um, and it's actually a drawing of Asherah, too, who was a goddess of uh, fertility, that kind of stuff. And actually, Asherah has many different um, variations of her names because she made the rounds. She was an Egyptian goddess and a Can Canaanite goddess, and a, I mean, she she's been everywhere. She uh, she's been everywhere. So on this artifact, it says Yahweh and his Asherah. And Asherah is depicted in the image as his wife. So um, this shows us that around this time there was a very um, active cult that was uh, very much so not following the line and blurring the lines of Yahweh's, um, Yahweh's holiness. So in the minds of Israel, though, they, they, they didn't get this. They hadn't abandoned Yahweh in their mind. In their mind, um, they were just expanding their religion. They were embracing and accepting others. You know, I, I'm not trying to be judgmental. You know, I'm, I'm trying to you know, un understand more fully. I'm trying to be more welcoming. I'm, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I'm just making little compromises to kind of keep the peace and to kind of keep things going. And, you know, I think that God's happy with, with us getting along. And if I really love them, then I'll, that kind of stuff. So um, they combined worship of other gods with Yahweh. And they just combined them together. And they thought, ah, that, that's fine. That's not, that's not really a big deal. And uh, the law became kind of second rate, not overly that important to them. By and large, um, something very similar has happened in modern in modern Christian circles. You know, the Bible has kind of lost a lot of its importance, and so you kind of have this rift to, rift to developing in the Christian church. There's like the intellectual people who don't have love, but they know heresy, and you know they 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 know the truth. And then there's these people who don't know anything about the Bible, and or or even about God, but um, they tend to be more accepting of people, and there's very few that are in the middle. So like you have the charismatic movement right now going on at Bethel Church with, you know, all that nonsense that's going on with Johnson and all that. He would be, for instance, the whole Philly stuff about, you know, that Christianity divide, nothing about the intellectual side. And then on YouTube, you have a lot of the intellectual teachers um, who just have no love for really anyone. And uh, so God, however, saw things much different. Um, he has this kind of idea that if he's not Lord of all, then he isn't Lord at all. And um, very much so disagreed with what uh, Judah was, was, was believing at the time. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord, and I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coast of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed the gods? And it's gods. Yet they are not gods at all. So just to kind of give you a little bit of idea of what's going on, Cyprus is an island in the Mediterranean Sea. So that would be wet to the west. Excuse me. And Kedar is uh, northern Arabia. There's, just, there's just some tribes there. That would be where that is. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror. Now, there is a little bit of a, a, a play that's going on that's oftentimes missed here. And let me kind of just explain that. Um, so the people who worshipped idols didn't believe that the idol was the God. They believed that it was a, a door to the God. That makes sense. A representation that they can could connect to the cosmic. To the to, does that make sense? They didn't actually believe that the idol was itself. But God here clearly is is making fun of that belief. He's saying no, there is no God behind that door. It is just a piece of wood you are worshiping. And uh, he constantly talks down to these gods because they're not gods at all. In fact, he says that right there, are not gods at all. <laughs> so, uh, declares the Lord, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold any water. Is Israel a servant, a slave by birth? Why then has he become a plunder? Lions have roared, they have growled at him, they have laid waste his land. 
His towns are burned and deserted. Also, the men of Memphis and Tepanes have cracked your uh, skull. Have you not brought this on yourself by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? Now, wh now, why go to Egypt to drink water from the Nile? And why go to Syria to drink water from the Euphrates? So if you are, of, you know, my generation, the next generation, you're probably thinking, what the heck is he even talking about? <laughs> so let's kind of try and break this down. First off, you know, the, the, the beginning part is kind of easy to explain. He's saying, look around, you know, explore the, the, the geography of, of the area, you know, go out and, and look around. Has a nation ever changed its God? Um, and the, the idea here is that the other nations are more faithful to their false gods than Israel is to Yahweh, which is obviously not great. <laughs> you don't really, you don't really want God to know you for that. Um, and then the same thing he says here, be appalled at this, you heavens. God here is calling witness from creation and also from the host of heaven. So he's calling from two different sources. Um, one is more overt and one's more covert. He's he's calling on his creation more 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 um, generally, like so. For instance, the host of heaven, the angels. But he's also talking about his creation, the stars and whatnot. This doesn't mean that the sky is a person or that the stars are people. It simply means that the creator is calling on his creation as witness. It's a poetical way of, of expressing an extreme. So basically, you could say something similar as saying, "I call on my bed as witness to my unfaithful spouse." I mean, your bed's not actually going to talk. It's just kind of a, say, a way that, you know, the stars themselves are witness. They, they, there's above you witnessing the evil that you have done. You know, I'm calling, you know, this witness. Anyways, so it, it don't don't read too much into it, you know. <laughs> the, the, the stars aren't people or anything or, or dead people or whatever. Or people who will yet exist or whatever. No. Um, so he says, there's my people have committed two sins. The two sins are leaving God and embracing idols. So the question then becomes, well, hold on. Does that mean that they would have been better off to just abandon God and not have religion, just be like atheists? Well, here's the thing. Everybody worships something. And so if you turned away from God, you would by necessity be turning towards something else. The, the two sins are inseparable. They're, they're, they go together. If you turn from God, you turn towards something else. So if they turn towards atheism, for instance, they would be worshiping themselves and their own desires and passions and ideas and, and morality. So it wouldn't actually be any better. Um, and it says here that God is like a fresh, uh, fresh spring, a fresh, fresh water. And he compares what they're doing, the idols that they're following, like building a broken cistern. So I am a fresh spring of water. You can come and drink anytime. But instead, you've built, you've gone to all the water, all the trouble of building the cistern, which is basically um, a giant container in the ground that held water. You had to build it just right or else it would leak. And uh, so he's saying you, you have the cistern that's, that's not holding water. It's broken. It's not, it's not doing what it's supposed to. And you actually wasted your time and effort to do it too. Um, so they have forsaken me the spring and also dug their own cisterns. It takes us to the last part of this section. <clears throat> is Israel's servant a slave by birth? Why then has he become plunder? Now, there were warning signs before Jeremiah ever prophesied. God gave lots of different warnings, warnings to the people, and some of those warnings are what's mentioned here, um, and they just didn't pay attention to. They were they had been raided by other other tribes and other peoples, and were losing different belongings. Towns were getting burned down. Not through the course of five years. We're talking about course of, of, of hundreds of years. Um, ever since King Solomon died, you can read it, how, how they were having problems and stuff. So there were there were warning signs, and they just weren't paying attention to those warning signs. And it says, uh, so the lions would have been like raiding tribes and stuff like that. But then you have here, it says, also the men of Memphis and Tiffany's, these are two cities of Egypt. And the illusion is very clear. The Egyptians had beaten Judah twice. Once, shortly after Solomon had uh, died, and his son, um, I want to say Rahab, but it might, might that might not be right. It's either Rahab or Jeroboam. Rahab, that sounds right. It might be Rehoboam. That sounds right. I believe it's Rehoboam. I knew it wasn't Rahab, but that was the only name that was coming to mind. I believe it was Rehoboam. So uh, his son Rehoboam you know, took the throne, and he gets this idea that he's going to reunite the whole place. Well, it doesn't work. And it ultimately ends with... Um, King Shishak from from uh, Egypt coming in and um, and you know winning against uh, against uh, Judah and then another time one of the kings uh, I want to say it was either Josiah or uh, I'm not sure right now I'd have to go back and look but um, he went out and tried to oppose Egypt and he got killed for it um, he he died actually I think it actually was Josiah so the the illusion is very clear um, that that um, you know, the different things here. This is not a message that Judah would have missed. 
And uh, obviously, you have brought this. Have, have you not brought this on yourself by forsaking the Lord your God? Um, these things were deserved. They weren't just like uncalled for. You know, God wasn't just being mean. They were punishments for their sin, and they were failing to learn the lesson. They were not turning away from it. Um, Jeremiah. If some people we have we have this idea that you know God had been silent, and then Jeremiah came and was like, oh. Well, now you aren't giving us any warnings. Jeez, I was like, no, there were lots of warnings. And there were lots of other prophets before Jeremiah came too. It wasn't like, oh, that was a blind side. Um, so then he mentions here, um, now why go to Egypt to drink water? They were trying to, okay, so in, God offered them um, protection. And they didn't want to worship God, but then they weren't protected. So what they did is they said, Let's make some alliances. And so they made alliances with, with uh, Assyria. They made alliances with Egypt trying to fix the problem. And they made these alliances to feel secure about this rather than trust, go, returning to God and trusting in God. And so he's saying, what, what's the purpose of this? Why are you going to drink the waters from the Nile? Let's make, make an alliance with Egypt. Why go to Assyria to drink water from the Euphrates? Why go and make an alliance with Euphrates? Or I mean with Assyria. Why not just, you know. Reconcile yourself to God. And that brings up a very interesting question. In that passage, it says, I will punish you. But then he says, also, I'll punish your children's children. So the question being, why punish the grandchildren? What's the purpose of that? I thought that every single person was responsible for their own sin. Well, let me build on this, okay? First off, sins impact the whole family up to three generations. Now, why is that? Because three generations lived together. You had the grandparents with the parents with the kids. That's how families lived back then. You had three Three generations per household. So whenever one of those, especially the elders or the, or the uh, patriarchs or whatever you want to say of that family would sin, it would impact the whole family. Sins perpetrated by parents will oftentimes become struggles of the children. You find, some, you find somebody who drinks, for instance. Their kids will oftentimes have a problem with drinking. You find a, a parent who's just very self-absorbed. His, his ch child will become, you know, they'll try to be more present and everything, but they'll still make it all about themselves. You know, the, the, the action might be different, but the heart is, is the same, you know. And so you have these, these the root problem just being perpetrated over and over again by, by parents and children. Um, and... Uh, and so that gives two kind of options left for, for the children of, of, the, of the parent. They can either indulge in the sin or they can fight it. And for those who indulge in the sin, they heap up a, a double curse on themselves. But if they turn from it, then um, they, they'll still struggle with it or whatnot, but the, it, it, won't, it won't rest on them. The, well, the curse won't rest on them. Um, so this is more, more of um, the, the punishment will come on... God, Okay, so God is punishing them, and he will keep an eye on their kids and their, and their kids after them to see if they follow in the sin or not. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. And if they do fall in the sin, then they'll heap up a, a double curse on themselves. Those who follow God get blessings for thousands of generations, and those who, who hate God, they only get for three generations. So, I mean, that's, that's something worth noting, that, that God literally said that, hey, for those who love me, I will watch out for their, gener for their descendants a thousand in the future. To, to give undeserved blessings from one person's righteousness. And so, I mean, I think that, you know, obviously. Uh, and then we get to the to the modern problem where people ask about gener generational curses all the time. Here's the thing. Jesus breaks the bond of curses. Problem solved. Unless the sin is repeated. If a Christian calls himself a Christian but, but perpetrates a sin, there... God won't just sit there and be like, yeah, you're fine. Go ahead and do whatever the hell you want. I mean, that, that's, that's not, that's not going to happen. Like, if we choose to live in sin, then we're also choosing the consequences of that. And remember, Jeremiah is prophesying to God's people, which means that if God's people stop living for God and start living according to their sin instead, that Jesus isn't going to give you get our jail free card. They just go to, get to go do whatever you want to do. So if your father's alcoholic, you have a higher chance uh, that you will be too. And that science backs that up too. That's not just something crazy that the Bible says. I mean, it's something that science shows us too. Um, so let's read. And I believe we're going to stop at verse 25. So this is the last uh, last section of Jeremiah chapter 2. I really wanted to finish chapter 2, but I, there was just no way it was too long. Your wickedness will punish you. Your backsliding will rebuke you. Consider then and realize how evil and bitter it is for you uh, when you forsake the Lord your God and have no awe of me, declares the Lord, 
the Lord Almighty. Long ago, I, I, I broke off your yoke and tore off your bonds, and you said, I will not serve you. Indeed, on every high hill and under every spreading tree you lay down as a prostitute. I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? Although you wash yourself with soap and use an abundance of cleansing powder, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Sovereign Lord. How can you say, I am not defiled, I have not run after the bells? See how you behaved in the valley. Consider what you have done. And we'll get to that in just a minute. You are a swift she-camel running here and there, a wild donkey accustomed to the desert, sniffing the, wa the wind in her craving. In her heat, who can restrain her? Any males that pursue her need not tire themselves. At mating time, they will find her. Do not run until your feet are bare and your throat is dry. But you said, it's no use. I love foreign gods and I must go after them. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, and we, we really can't blow through this section. There's a lot of stuff here. First off, he mentions here at the beginning here in verse 19, your wickedness will punish you. And the thing about living in sin is that living in sin brings its own punishment. Besides what God brings, sin brings its own punishment. When you start doing drugs, for instance, what happens? You lose everything. When you start sleeping ground, what happens? You get diseases. You get heartache. What happens when you abandon God? You feel restless and discontent. You feel lost, alone, afraid. These are things that sin, by its nature, has a degrading quality to it. It makes us feel worse. It makes us enslaved. It makes us bound. It makes us hurt more. It makes bad things happen naturally, aside from whatever punishment God brings. The thing itself, it's like this. Sin can be compared to touching a very hot stove, like that, my, that fireplace over there. Yeah, you can go over there and touch it. It's going to burn your hand. Now, let's say I say, okay, Isaiah, if you touch that fireplace, I'm going to give you a spanking. Just roll with me on this. I'm not really going to give you a spanking, bro. But let's just say that that's what the deal is, okay? So then you go over there and you touch it. Just by touching it, you've already been hurt. That's aside from whatever punishment I said to you. So Judah has been touching the fireplace for years after years after years now. Their hand is scarred, bloodied, bruised. And yet they're not learning from their own stupidity. Like it just, they just keep you know, throwing up and then eating it again. Um, and it says here right here, you have no awe of me. They had forgotten who God was and what he did. Uh, they were not amazed by God and all that he had done. He was just another God to them. Think about that. He was just another God. Yahweh. The one who set them free from captivity was just another guide to them. He was equal to the idols. And how do we know that? Because they were worshiping Yahweh and the idols. Yahweh was nothing to them. That's, 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 well, that's, that's not good. And he says here, long ago I broke off your yoke. Now, if you have some different translations, they're going to read differently. It, some of the translations are going to say, long ago you broke off your yoke and tore off your bonds. It could go either way, how this sentence is translated it could literally go either way but long ago you broke off your yoke doesn't make a whole lot of sense by and large um when did that happen see what i mean like that didn't happen but long ago i broke off your yoke. okay now we're talking about the exodus yeah that, that makes a lot more sense so work animals had yokes on them like they had yokes when they were in egypt god broke them off um so the nisb reading is, is much more likely um, and so that brings us to the concept of, of a prostitute. Now, obviously, a prostitute is someone who has sex with somebody for money. Duh, everybody knows that. But so how does that apply to Israel? Well, they weren't... Well, let me get to that. They were having sex. They were having sexual immorality. Yes, absolutely. But um, the idea here is that... Um, that that's going to pick up on the on the microphone real bad. The, cl the clinging. Yeah. Uh, the idea here is that Israel was spiritually a prostitute. That they were sleeping around with the other gods uh, because of how many they, they worshipped. Worship would be the, uh, akin to sleeping with. Um, so they were trying to get profit through the religious traditions as they did these different things like worshipping the bells and, and going through the rituals. They hoped that they would have more fertile lands, more fertile wives, that you know they would stop being attacked by the different nations. So they were actually hoping to get paid from, from their worship to the gods. So there was an element of prostitution in that way too. Um, there's also another element of prostitution, which I'll mention again later, but the Baal cult had a um, had a, uh, a whole thing to it where they had like cult prostitutes and stuff. So there was actual sexual immorality um, element to it too. So there's the three different ways that that, that that applies with them being a prostitute. Um, so indeed, on every high hill and under every spreading tree, you lay down as a prostitute. 
I had planted you as a choice vine, and yet somehow you, you became a corrupt wild vine. So the idea here is that Israel had been cultivated by God. He had taken care of them, you know, really uh, tended to this plant. But somehow they just became a wild and producing vine. It's just, it's just this un, un, untamed thing. There's, and uh, so that's a corrupt wild vine. This, they're not producing. And uh, which is, you know, that's the real thing of it because he's a choice vine of sound and reliable stock and you became this um and then he says here although you wash yourself with soap and use an abundance of cleansing power the stain of your guilt so there 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 was a stain that they couldn't be removed of now this shouldn't um conjure us to hopelessness and i'll talk about this in the end that's definitely not the point of the prophet jeremiah this situation wasn't necessarily hopeless um uh but I do want to mention that um, the things that they were that they that they are mentioned of being tried were all external, soap and 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 cleansing power it had nothing to do with change of heart. And then the second thing is they didn't actually try this. He said, although you wash yourself, oh, actually he did say that, um, although you wash yourself with soap, that could be taken in one of two different ways. Either you have tried this, you are currently trying this, or even if you did try this. Um, so, and I do want to mention that Jesus can also bring the cleansing of stains. So, so that is that is something different. But they hadn't actually repented and turned from their ways. So they still had guilt, and they still had a stain. They had, you know, doing the outer things that wouldn't have done anything. Oftentimes, especially when we get involved with sin, all we really have to do is just acknowledge our sin to God and repent of it, and then like things just have a way of turning around. Um, then the next section here, how can you say I am not defiled? This is really um, kind of funny in a sad way. Um, and so let me break this down. I already mentioned about the the, the, the part about the, um, the pagan god worship involved cult prostitutes. I already mentioned that. So that in and of itself would have been defiling because, you know, the Jews were real big on cleanliness and that kind of stuff. And you know, when you did certain things, you had to have like a moment of unclean, uncleanliness before you were clean again. And uh, so there, there's that kind of illusion there. But he's also talking about something that's kind of bigger. They said, how can you say, um, I'm not defiled? They, they were literally justifying themselves and saying, oh, no, it's okay for me to do that because of this. And then even when they were caught like dead to rights, they would still deny it. They denied that they had done anything wrong. And um, I've actually seen many people who call themselves Christians nowadays who do this. Like, they, they still are unable to just say, yes, I messed up. Um, there are there are some people that I personally have had to deal with that, that are not welcome in different church settings because they, you know, cause problems, won't admit to their problem. And it's like, you can't really fix a problem that you won't even admit to. You know what I mean? So, um, it's not uncommon in Christians living in sin, the, this whole this whole mentality here just deny it oh I, I didn't do that i didn't do that it was extremely common you see kind of the same things happen over and over again um there was actually a story i was gonna um gonna mention well i could tell you about that story i was gonna tell you a different story but i can't remember it right now something to do with eh. I'm not going to remember it. I'll just tell you this other story. There was this woman I was dealing with, and uh, she kept gossiping and just gossiping and gossiping. I mean, she, she always said these snide things all the time, cutting people down, being hateful, being rude. Um, she even had, besides the bad attitude, she always had, like, this scowl on her face. And uh, so then, uh, uh, you know, I, I numerous times me and Pastor both tried talking to her. You know, okay, look, you know, this is not really how Christians should be acting. And the whole, I, I didn't do anything wrong. And it's like, Okay, but but you did though, and so you know, like here's proof, you know, and so you know, we need to talk about this. I didn't do anything wrong. Just like denying that it even happened. It was like, are you crazy? Like I was there for that. Like you can't tell me that didn't happen. I was there. Um, uh, I could tell you lots of other stories. Um, there was one situation where there was this this dude that was uh, there was gossiping in the middle of a lesson and and, and lying about you know what somebody had said and uh, lying about a situation and. Uh, and uh, I, I tried talking to him, and he just completely, oh, no, I didn't do that. I was like, I got it on recording for the lesson was recorded. I, it was recorded, like, I don't understand, like, what you're, <laughs> like, you can't deny it. It happened. 
oh no, you know, it, it was them. They were, they were the, I didn't do anything wrong. And it's like, are you, are you joking? And so, I mean, this is something that, that repeats itself and Christians themselves do nowadays. This isn't something that like, oh, those sinners back then, how could they ever do that? Well, I mean, <laughs> we're doing a lot of the same things. Um, and then another thing he says here is, how can you say I'm not defiled? How, see how you behaved in the valley. What valley is he talking about? Well, he mentions this later in the book. Um, 731, for instance, is one of the places. But they were actually sacrificing their children in the valley of Hinnom. So he says here, see how you behaved in the valley. You literally sacrificed your children in the valley of Hinnom. And you are saying, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm not defiled. And it's like, are you crazy? That is crazy talk. Of course, I mean, I've wanted to kill children before, but that doesn't mean I have killed children before. Like when you're on an airplane and you go, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> just joking, guys. I wouldn't kill children and get caught. Just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Gee whiz. Now I'm going to feel really bad if I'm ever accused of killing a child. And I'll be like, I didn't mean it. <laughs> so then the last part says, you are a swift she-camel. Um, if you've had animals, this shouldn't be like that big of a surprise to you. The, Judah is being compared to an animal in heat. They are quick and ready to go to the idols in the same way that an animal is quick and ready to go in mating season to go find, um, you know, a male. Um, and uh, let's see. It says, you do not run until your feet are bare there at the end. I believe that's 20 verse 24 or 25. Do not run until your feet are bare and your throat is dry. Israel was wear literally wearing itself out and their throat was parched from their effort, but they wouldn't just stop and turn back to God. They were literally wearing themselves out. And uh, and here at the end, um, he says something that, that, that's kind of more discouraging than anything because he's quoting something that they are saying. He isn't just like making up a hypothetical situation. This is something that people are God's people are actually saying, but you said it's no use. Remember, they just said, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. Now they're saying it's no use, you know, turning from what I'm doing. I love foreign gods and I must go after them. When we continue to live in sin, there's this thing that happens where we eventually feel hopeless. There's kind of, there's kind of stages of sin, okay? The first, we, we start getting into sin and we feel like this tug at our conscience and we feel kind of like, ooh, this is, this is, I don't feel great about doing this. But then the more we do it, the more we kind of live um, where we start to justify ourselves to others. Like, no, no, I haven't done anything wrong. It's okay for me to do this. And then we reach this final stage where we like, we live boldly in the, in the sin. Like, we're, we're, no, this is part of who I am now. This is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to turn from this. And it's kind of like, we, we get to this point of, hey, there's no use. I can't turn from it even if I wanted to. And uh, so when we continue to live in sin, we eventually come to this place of feeling hopeless. And sin always does that. It doesn't ever make us feel anything else. I mean, like, sin, a good way of describing sin is it feels good at a time, and it it feels worse. It feels good worse. in the moment, but yes, but then afterwards it feels worse. So it's like, here's you, and then here's you doing the sin, here's you after the sin. A great example of this would be porn. Porn feels great. It's fun. You, you know, you, 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 don't, you don't have to be... You don't have to be anything to anybody. You can just do whatever you want. You know, you don't have someone judging you. You don't have to perform. You can just close yourself off from the world and you just, you know, look at pretty girls all day. Who, what guy does that not appeal to? Like, show me that guy and I'll say he's dead. Like, it just doesn't happen. Like, that, that's just a very appealing thing for guys. And so then you do it and it feels great. I mean, you just hear people say porn, uh, porn is terrible. Well, I mean, the effects of porn are terrible, but doing it makes you feel great so then after you have this crash of guilt and shame and all oh, what have i done and you know i'll never do it again then you do it again and you feel guilty about doing it again so i mean you go through this endless process of just making yourself feel worse and worse until finally satan has you so backed into a corner where you've completely forgotten your identity in christ and it is completely like you are attached to your next failure but you don't see any other way besides failing because you've only ever failed and it just becomes a part of hollowing you out. And uh, that that's what sin does. And so that's exactly what these people had done. They didn't have hope anymore. It's no use. I love the foreign gods. So uh, we eventually feel burdened like we will always mess up. Then eventually we switch to doing it unashamed without guilt. Hey, 
This is just who I am. And then God stops even talking to us about it. No, it's not that bad. And so we fluctuate between feeling extreme guilt and complete apathy. And you see that that's exactly what's happened to Judah. They know in their inner heart that things aren't right, that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Do you know what I mean? And so they feel, uh, oh, it's no use. But then when Jeremiah is trying to talk to them about it, I'm not doing anything wrong. Do you know what I mean? They're fluctuating between these two extremes. And um, so we eventually switch to doing it um, all the time. It's just a part of who I am. And, yeah. But it, sir? Is that kind of what you'd call it, being given over to it? Well, I would use different terms. Uh, being given over, I would say, is when you... It, I think being given over has stages to it. So I think being given over is when God has set you free from something and you go back to it willingly. Mm -hmm. And then the more you go back to it, the more the less control you have about giving yourself back over until you are fully given over. I think being given over to something is a, is a, is a spectrum. I think that is a journey and a process of failure. I don't think it's one mistake. One I, right. I think this is like, uh, I'm making a habit of messing up. You know what I mean? And so the question is, we, we, we kind of, or the problem is we, we lose the forest for the trees and we, we start thinking that my failure makes me a failure. Does this see the difference? When no, you are failing, that doesn't make you a failure. And so it becomes a part of your identity. And at this point is when people just get hard-hearted towards God because their sin has literally corrupted their minds, corrupted their thoughts, blinded them. And so the ironic thing is that you don't change that by stopping the sin. You change that by seeking God. It's this crazy thing, and then God changes you, and then that changes how you do the sin. People have this idea, I'm going to fix it, I'm going to stop doing this bad thing, and then everything's going to go back to being great, and God's going to be happy with me again. That's never going to happen. And as long as Satan can get you to focus on trying to be perfect enough for God to accept you back, you have all, you are spurning God's free gift of grace. But once you realize, hey, God loves me and accepts me while I'm in this sin, then you can seek him with your whole heart while you're still stuck in the sin. And then eventually God changes your heart and you get out of the sin. It's a process. But we want to go to the very end and skip the whole part where we have to seek God. Like, I don't got time to see God. Who's got time for that? I just want to be out of this thing so I don't feel guilty anymore. I don't want to feel better. I mean, I get that. That's why people go to go to drugs. You know, I want to feel better now. Um, so, and it becomes a part of, it's who I am. But it ends as it, as it ended for Israel. As it always ends, punishment, disaster, loss, pain. There's no other way that sin goes. Punishment, disaster, loss, pain. Now, the thing is, the, the trick is that when you reach this point, because everybody does, I have, you have, we all have. We all will probably, we might, all might do it again. When you reach a stage to weather the storm and grow through it, that's the problem. When we get caught, especially in our own sins, I'm um, speaking from my own experience here, so it might not relate to what you guys are going through, but um, when, I, when I was in that place, you know, where looking back about, all, you know, all the different things that, then you know my own i got myself into it it, it just became hopeless and you know and nobody really understood me i really felt like kind of just end of the road you know uh, kind of a dead end and uh so i had to weather that storm and i didn't commit suicide i didn't give up and eventually things turned around but i had to go through that dark night that i'd got myself into and that's the problem is that it, Judah wanted a quick fix to the problem. And you see them actually saying a lot of this stuff later on. They're like, you know, how can we possibly make it where this problem doesn't exist anymore? <laughs> and they couldn't. <laughs> they got was saying, no, no, you guys don't get it. You are going into exile. And then they get they get all bitter about it. Oh, our fathers, they, they've eaten sour grapes and, and we're the one with, 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 the, with the tea set on edge. And God's like, no, <laughs> you were sinning. <laughs> I've told you this. You guys aren't listening. You guys were sinning. This is a result of that. There's nothing you can do to get out of it. This is the punishment that's coming. In 70 years, you'll come back from exile. Okay? Everybody clear on this? And they're still like, uh, no. Anyways. Yeah, so it's a process. Definitely is. So next week, we'll finish up chapter 2 and start getting to 3. Hopefully, we'll finish up this prophecy. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we won't go any further than the end of this prophecy. So uh, I started mentioning this earlier, and I said that I would mention it again later. So here I am mentioning it. Is there no hope then for those who are caught in sin? Yes, of course there's hope. But for those who listen to God and turn from their sin. And later in the book, Jeremiah is going to talk about the hope. Yes, absolutely. But right here, his point is talking about the punishment, the consequences, that kind of stuff. So different messages for different times. For instance, if your child is repentant, 
they come to you and like, Daddy, I'm really sorry that I messed up, you know, and they're trying to make amends, that probably wouldn't be the best time to say, hey, you suck, and I'm taking away all your video games now. It's like, okay, all right, calm down. Bad timing. Like, they're trying to make amends for what they did wrong. This isn't the right time to be pulling out the, the bombardment of attacks. I reel it in. And, uh, I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about. God, at this point, is talking to a very hard-hearted Judah, and he's not ready to uh, progress forward from that. So, um, God even, But with that being said, I want to point out that God even showed mercy to those people who didn't turn. Um, in, in the book of Jeremiah, he also showed mercy to people who didn't deserve it and didn't turn from their sins. So um, there is obviously always hope 